No power in the world can take away what I have experienced. No situation can ever be repeated. The author, who was sent to a Nazi concentration camp where many Jews were persecuted and miraculously survived, talks about the meaning of life. In this issue, we will discuss the work Man's Search for Meaning, an introduction to logotherapy by Austrian Jewish psychiatrist Viktor Emil Frankl. In 1939, Nazi Germany invaded Poland, triggering World War II, and the Nazis and their allies massacred some 8 million Jews in a Holocaust that was carried out under state sponsored incitement to anti Semitism, a prejudice that had long taken root in the country. This book is a post-survival record of Frankl's realistic observations of the transition of the human psyche and behavior under extreme conditions, and the process of finding despair and hope, as he was captured by the Nazis simply because he was Jewish and forced to live in a harsh concentration camp. The title, Night and Fog, which is familiar as the title of the Japanese version, is derived from a special order by Adolf Hitler who had secretly carried out a series of disappearances of Jewish families in various places under the fog of night since 1941. There are four main characters. Frankel, a Jewish doctor who worked at a mental hospital in Vienna and was sent to a concentration camp while working on an unfinished manuscript. His fellow prisoners, whom he met during his six-month internment experience from his arrival at Auschwitz to his liberation at the end of the war. The Nazi SS officers who had absolute authority in the camps and oversaw the inmates. And his wife, Tilly, who was captured by the Nazis after only nine months of marriage, separated from her husband Frankel and died in another camp. Frankel says that when we are in the depths of disappointment in our lives, if we thoroughly worry about suffering for whom and suffering for what, a new path will naturally open up from there, and we will find the meaning of life. One morning in 1941, Frankel, then 36 years old and living with his family in his hometown of Vienna, Austria, was ordered by Nazi authorities to report to the military headquarters, which was conducting a hunt for Jews. Secretly, the hunt for Jews had been going on in and around Germany since 1933, before the outbreak of World War II, and there were six camps in Germany when war was declared. In addition, over the next two years, new camps were built in occupied countries such as Poland and Austria. More than 12 million Jews, young and old, were taken to these camps, which claimed 8 million lives. Although the actual conditions inside the camps were kept secret by the military, rumors gradually began to leak out, and Jews lived their lives with bated breath, thinking, tomorrow is my life. Frankel who had just started his own private psychiatric hospital after working at a mental hospital in Vienna, was also ordered to report to prison, and he prepared himself for, the day had finally come. However, he unexpectedly attracted the interest of the Gestapo, Nazi Germany's state secret police, when he spoke about his knowledge of neuroses and phobias, and was given a one-year stay of detention in a camp and allowed to work in the psychiatric department of a Gestapo-run Jewish hospital. He began writing a manuscript to summarize the theories he had developed as a doctor in conjunction with actual cases before he was eventually notified that he would be sent to an internment camp. Once placed in a camp, there is no guarantee of life. He wanted to leave a proof that he had lived. Through an intermediary, Frankel obtained a visa that allowed him to seek asylum in the United States, but after much deliberation, he chose to stay in Vienna with his family. The day finally came in September 1942 when he was on the verge of completing his manuscript. After his capture, Frankel was sent to a camp in Czechoslovakia with his parents and his wife, who had only been married for nine months. His father soon starved to death in the camp, and after two years of detention there, Frankel was sent to the infamous Auschwitz concentration camp. His wife, who worked at the arsenal, decided to accompany Frankel even though she was exempted from being transported to Auschwitz. The couple was transferred to Auschwitz by freight train in October 1944. 
A few days after their arrival, Frankel was sent to another camp in Bavaria, Germany, and his wife, who was separated from him at Auschwitz, later died at the Bergen-Belsen camp shortly after its liberation by British troops. His mother and brother died at Auschwitz, and Frankel's cherished family members had their lives taken away by the concentration camps. Frankel was one of the few inmates to survive to the end of the war at Auschwitz, which was exceptionally feared as an extermination camp, due in part to his fortunate survival during the first selection, his brief detention at Auschwitz, his transfer a few days later to a branch camp at Dachau concentration camp in southern Germany, and his transfer to Turkey, a camp for people sick with typhus rash, where he ended up at the end of the war. The origin of the story dates back to the arrival of Frankel and the other Jews, packed in a freight car, at a large stop in Auschwitz. The cry of, there's a sign for the station, Auschwitz, rises from inside the car, which has been transported without being told where it is going. Frankel and the others, tormented by anxiety, trembled at the moment they heard this cry. It was a notorious place where Jews gathered from all over the world were robbed of their money and goods, massacred by firing squad or in gas chambers, forced to work without eating or drinking, and subjected to unimaginable human experimentation. As Frankel and the other Jews who had been taken away were unloaded from the freight cars, and at the head of a long line of men and women lined up separately, a Nazi SS officer indifferently moved his index finger from side to side, sorting the frightened people in turn. Most were instructed to head to the right, but when it was Frankel's turn, the officer thought for a moment before instructing the few to head to the left. His property, belongings, and even his nearly finished manuscript, which he had hidden behind his jacket, were confiscated, and he was stripped of all his clothes and shaved of all his body hair. Frankel is whipped and taken into the shower room with the naked people who are standing in line. He was delighted to see that it was real water coming out of the shower nozzle, not horrifying poison gas, and was forced to stand outside soaking wet in the bitter cold of the approaching winter. He was stripped of his name, Victor Frankel, and given only a striped outfit and the number 119104. That evening, Frankel asks one of the old prisoners, I have not seen my friends and colleagues in the camp who were assigned to another side, where have they gone? He points to the smoke from a chimney a short distance away and replies, They're over there. Your friends are on his way to heaven. In other words, Frankel was sorted out as a worker and saved his life. A few days later, Frankel was transferred from Auschwitz to a branch camp at Dachau, another hellscape of forced labor, hunger, torture, human experimentation, and infectious diseases. Even so, he is amazed at the life force of human beings who gradually adapt to whatever environment they are plunged into, such as not catching a cold even without bedding in the freezing season and being able to sleep in a place covered in feces and urine without any problems. At the same time, many of the detainees who were placed in extreme conditions turned their eyes away from the horrific reality and changed into a numb, unfeeling, and indifferent state of mind. When he sees people being subjected to unreasonable violence by the warden, or when he sees his fellow workers dead in the morning, he simply looks on and no emotion arises, and gradually Frankel begins to see people abandon even the hope of living. He sees people who can no longer get out of bed when it is time for roll call, or who have smoked all the precious cigarettes they could exchange for food. Sometimes, before their lives are taken, they commit suicide by jumping into the high-voltage current barbed wire themselves. There were also many people who had pinned their hopes on an unproven rumor that they would be able to go home for Christmas vacation in a few months, only to be disappointed on Christmas Day and to die of despair and exhaustion. On the other hand, the few who survived had a goal that they never lost sight of. Frankel himself never lost his sense of mission to one day finish and publish the nearly completed manuscript, which had been taken from him upon his arrival at Auschwitz, in order to help those suffering from the diseases he had seen in his clinical activities. He spent every spare moment of sleep in the harsh conditions of the camps restoring the manuscript, spelling out words to fill the small scraps of paper that he had secretly obtained. It is not physical strength or worldly wisdom that gives a person the strength to live, 
but the spiritual attitude of the individual that gives strength to live even in the harshest of circumstances. There were those who took away the bread and shoes of their dying comrades, while there were those who gave bread and words of encouragement to their comrades while they themselves were on the verge of starvation. And even during the short breaks between meals, there were those who prayed to God and enjoyed music and humor. They were better able to survive the harshness of camp life because they had found a way to escape from the horror of the real world into the richness of their inner lives. Frankel is keenly aware that human beings are to all intents and purposes time-sensitive beings, creatures who derive spiritual support from having hope for the future. No one can take away our judgment of what attitude we should take toward a given situation. It is the last freedom of human beings. In the camps, the value of each person's life was thoroughly undermined. They were forced to do hard labor every day, not knowing when they would be liberated. Rations of soup and bread, which could only be thought of as water, were rationed. The hardship of waking up from a nightmare-induced sleep to the reality of hardship. In this life-threatening situation, the detainees lost their independence and tried to blend in with the herd like sheep being chased. But while they shared their suffering with their fellow sufferers, they often longed for solitude, to escape, even for a moment, from this unbearably coercive group. In the camps, many people took their own lives by their own hands, and there was even a rule that if you saw someone trying to commit suicide, you were not allowed to help them. One day, two fellow inmates who were about to commit suicide consulted Frankel, saying, we can't expect anything more from life. In response to their attempt to escape the pain of living, Frankel said, isn't there someone waiting for you somewhere? Or is there something you have left to do that has not yet been realized? Look hard. There must be someone or something out there that needs you. The two men thought for a moment, and then one said, there is a child waiting for me in a foreign country, and the other, a scientist, replied, I can't die until I finish my book. The realization that there was still something waiting for them in the world helped them to stop themselves from committing suicide. It is not a question of what we can expect from life, but rather what life expects of us. One can never abandon life when one is conscious of the responsibility for something that awaits him. The Hikapo, prisoners who were Jewish inmates like Frankel and the others, but who were given the same privileges as guards, persecuted the inmates, sometimes more harshly than the Nazi SS officers. Those inmates who were found to be suitable became Kapo, and those who refused to cooperate were immediately dismissed. While their fellow inmates were suffering from hunger and starvation, these elite prisoners, the Kapo, were not only poorly nourished, but some were even having the best time of their lives. This privileged minority saw the envy and resentment of their oppressed peers as a sign of success, and they took things from Frankel and his friends and violently attacked them as if to bury their childish inferiority complex. In the midst of this cruel competition for survival, Frankel turned away from the reality surrounding him, and sometimes wept, his chest tightening as he looked back on memories of a peaceful past. One evening, as Frankel and his friends were lying on the dirt floor, exhausted from their labor, a prisoner rushed in from outside and said, Hey, look over there. Tired or cold, just come out. Reluctantly, Frankel and the others went outside to the roll call area and saw the most spectacular sunset, a red sunset that filled the entire horizon. Why is the world so beautiful? Gazing at the beauty of nature, which existed regardless of their circumstances, they were able to forget, even for a moment, the hard life in the camps. What I have experienced, no power in the world can take away. No situation can ever be recreated again. As the war front approached, opportunities for escape increased, and a fellow who was engaged in medical care in a wing outside the camp attempted to escape. After much consideration, Frankel declined the invitation from his comrades. As soon as he decided to stay with his patients, the nagging feeling of guilt that had been smoldering in the back of his mind vanished like a lie. Early in the extremely cold early morning, a bracing wind blew against the thinly clad Frankel and the others as they marched to the workshop. 
No one spoke, and the man next to Frankel muttered, you know, if my wife saw us now. While everyone else stood in heavy silence thinking about their wives, Frankel had a strange experience as he looked up at the morning sky. He talked to the vivid image of his wife that his spirit had created. He heard her speak, even though she was not here, and her smile, and her eyes that encouraged and encouraged Frankel, shone a light on him at the end of his despair. His unaccounted for wife, who might have died in another camp. Frankel realized that if he could have that momentary experience of being deeply in touch with someone he truly loved engraved in his heart, his life would be enriched and fulfilled, and he would be able to live on the strength of that memory. Whether on the side of the camp warden or the prisoner, there were a very few who remained brave, proud, and selfless. They were not one of the herd who sought to satisfy their own self-interests, but those who demonstrated their own dignity in the face of a harsh fate. The Nazi SS officer who was the director of the branch of the Dachau camp to which Frankel was last sent spent a considerable amount of his own money to buy medicine from a pharmacy in a nearby town for inmates who were suffering from illness. Later, when the camp was liberated after the defeat of the Germans, the Jewish detainees sheltered him from the American troops by offering to hand him over only on the condition that they would not touch a single hair of this commander's head. The U.S. military took an official oath of commitment, and that Nazi officer, who was once again appointed camp director, procured food for the Jewish detainees and clothing from neighboring villagers. On another occasion, a young woman who had typhus and knew she had only a few days to live told Frankel, who was in charge of medical care at the camp. I never took seriously the idea of deepening my interiority when I was pampered and had no problems before. Now I am grateful to fate for leading me to such hardship. Then, radiantly, she pointed to a flowering Marania tree outside her window and said, That tree is my only friend in solitude. When I speak to it, it replies, I am here. I am here. I am eternal life. One evening, a starving inmate steals potatoes from the pantry. The guards demand that the intruder be handed over to them, and if he refuses, they will all be forced to fast for a day. 2,500 prisoners refuse to talk and opt for a day without food, but unfortunately a power outage on the same day piques the frustration of all. The head of the residential wing team appoints Frankel, a psychiatrist, and says, we can't have any more of our friends losing their lives due to mental breakdowns. I want you to speak in front of everyone with a proposal to prevent the next victim from occurring. Frankel spoke to his companions as they lay in total darkness. The odds of survival are extremely low, but I'm not going to give up hope and throw it away, because no one knows what the future holds, or even what will happen in the next moment. The future is undetermined, and even though we cannot expect the war to change tomorrow, we have experienced many times in the camps that personal fortunes can suddenly fall into place. What you have experienced, no force in this world can take away. For what we have suffered and what we have accomplished becomes the past, preserved forever as treasures of the heart. No matter what our circumstances, life has meaning. We hope that we do not suffer miserably and face our difficulties with pride so that we do not disappoint someone who is watching over us. This suffering has a deeper meaning as a sacrifice so that those we love will not suffer. Soon the beams of the barracks were lit, and the shabby-looking fellows staggered up to Frankel with tears in their eyes. A few mornings later, the white flag flew at the front gate of the camp, marking the day of liberation. The inmates, including Frankel, who had been under extreme tension for so long, somehow could not feel the joy of their freedom, and they simply walked out of the camp, dragging their tired feet, looking around in fear. Before long, the surveillance soldiers have taken off their military uniforms and changed into plain clothes with a deft hand, and some offer Frankel cigarettes. What the liberated comrades experienced was the frustration and disappointment of being pulled back from the unrealities of camp life into their former, altered sphere of life. Some of them suffered from the after-effects of the force torment, which damaged their personalities and made it difficult for them to adjust to life in the homeland they had dreamed of so long ago. And none of their families, 
whom they believed were waiting for them to return, opened the front door to greet them. I talk with my wife. I hear her answer and see her smile. I see her encouraging and encouraging eyes. And even though she is not there, her gaze illuminates me more than the sun that is now rising. I have now grasped the meaning of that which is the ultimate expression of human poetry, thought, and faith. It is the salvation of the creature by and in love.